Hello students, so welcome to this particular special session on the general anti-avoidance rule. Students, this particular lecture I am putting forth on an English mode, the Hindi version of the general anti-avoidance rule I have already have uploaded earlier in our YouTube channel, Durga Singh's tax classes, so that is already available, but I thought that let me put forth this general anti-avoidance rule topic which I consider to be an important topic for two reasons. One, it is something which could be targeted in the MCQ pattern and very likely now I have the gut feeling or an intuition you can say that they will target the some of the questions on GAR in MCQ pattern and then thereafter they may target maybe sometime descriptive question the way they have done it in November 17 old syllable CA final attempt. So on that note students let us start with this particular topic on the general anti avoidance rule. Those who are having your latest now as I told you the Hindi version of this topic is already uploaded in our YouTube which is already available if you can search the GAR as a topic and I am using the notes primarily which is in respect of the capsule or the regular batch students the GAR topic you will take that particular topic now. So that is a topic that we are now going to start off with. This note also students because there may be lot of other students who would be looking for this lecture. So for the benefit of the audience at large what I will do would be that I will put this topic or this notes in my telegram channel which is CA Durgesh Singh no space nothing continues CA Durgesh Singh. So that is our telegram channel you can just find the notes available over there. Let us begin with the students take the first page the general anti avoidance rule. Now in this regard students I think those who are referring to the capsule notes so for all these students you will have page 877 I suppose. So we will start with this particular point now let us begin with this page 877 the capsule students. So accordingly Eight seventy-seven. Those who are referring to their capsule notes, they can refer to that booklet. Or else, let's begin with this. I've ensured that the content I've kept it exhaustive, completely on this particular topic. I've introduced a lot of case studies as well in this particular topic. You are all advised to go through those case studies because beyond that, I don't think that there will be any need for referring anything because this is the most comprehensive coverage that is available as far as this very important topic is concerned. So let me begin with the discussion students why this topic is necessary or what was the need of this particular topic general anti avoidance rule what is the name general anti avoidance rule meaning thereby there would be an attempt to avoid the tax on the part of the SSE an attempt to avoid the tax on the part of the SSE and this specific provision is going to going to cancel that particular attempt made by the SSE for avoiding his tax liability. So the very reason why this provision is introduced is to ensure that those very attempt made by the SSE to avoid the taxes those attempt is been put on check on regulation by virtue of the specific provision which is available before law for us. We will look into it one by one. I will start with one simple example. Students we have got this clubbing income chapter. So there is a clubbing provision which is there. Now in that particular chapter we have seen that that there are certain person to whom you transfer the asset or there is a shift of the income there is an attempt on the part of a person to transfer the asset or 
transfer its income without any sort of an adequate consideration, isn't it? If you see the list, you have got say spouse or for that matter say son's wife. In fact, there is also a case of a minor child income also maybe get clubbed in the hands of the parents unless that is to do with his own skill. But what about a case where a particular parent is transferring a particular asset which has a fixed income or a regular income from such asset to an 18 year old child. So in that very case, whether the clubbing provision will it be applicable and that income is say from that asset is say 2 to 2 and a half lakhs. So if you are transferring that asset to that other person who happens to be a child 18 years old in that regard, that 18 years old is still a college going student. He will not have its income at least for another 5 or 6 years and he also has the basic exemption limit, isn't it? So what may happen now would be that these are the various attempts that can be made to try to take the loophole in the existing law and try to obtain, obtain what? A tax benefit. So they are exploiting or they are abusing or they are misusing the existing provision of law in a way to obtain with the objective of, what is the objective? Objective is to obtain the tax benefit. So therefore, the existing anti-avoidance provision which is there in the law is incapable, is incapable of addressing these issues. And there can be some 10,000 such particular cases which can be designed or arranged in order to obtain the tax benefit and the law cannot keep on highlighting each and every case in a specific manner. That is a limitation of the law that they cannot keep on writing for each of the arrangement which the person makes to avoid the tax liability for that arrangement every time. You cannot have a particular specific provision in the law because if that is what we will have it then the act or the income tax law you can just imagine the volume or the the huge particular list of such cases that will become like a dictionary and that is the reason why they thought that let us have a specific provision which is already there in the existing law which covers maximum cases but yes we cannot rule out other cases where the SSC will make an attempt to misuse the existing provision of the law in order to avoid his tax liability. And that is those cases for ad addressing for those cases that they have come up with, come up with what? The general anti-avoidance rule. So here is the situation now students. In the existing income tax law, we have specific anti-avoidance rule. I have given you the example clubbing provision. Now let me put forth transfer pricing provision. Again, there is a kind of an arrangement or an international transaction between two or more A at a particular price which is less than the arm's length price and thereby this is leading to, leading to what? Leading to a significant erosion of the tax base in India. And accordingly, in order to address that particular issue that we have now under the income tax law, the specific provision. What is that? The transfer pricing provision. So transfer pricing provision, therefore, we can say it is a specific anti-avoidance rule. Clubbing provision, specific anti-avoidance rule. I will also right now or maybe it's after some point of time, I will also give you a bit of backdrop of a very important amendment of the Finance Act 2018 which also has introduced for one case a specific anti-avoidance rule. For one case there is a specific anti-avoidance rule. So what is that case? I will just let you know a bit later. So students in this particular case what we will now get into it would be that we shall try to put forth one by one each and every aspect 
of the of the general anti avoidance rule provision but before i start with those aspect of the gar provision let us first look into the particular simple concept of tax planning tax evasion and then thereafter the tax avoidance so here in students tax planning the law itself provides you the provision if you satisfy the condition of those provision then you will be allowed the tax benefit that is a specific wordings of law wherein the intention of the law is to provide you the tax benefit example being like chapter 6a if you see the chapter 6a provision or maybe even 10 aa provision these provisions are being introduced for the purpose of providing the ssc the tax benefit so there is an express mandate to provide the tax benefit by the legislatures and therefore if you aware if you go by the condition of those particular section if you satisfy the condition of those particular section then yes the reduction of the tax that has happened because of the satisfaction of the condition in those particular provision those reduction will be in the form of a tax planning and tax planning is legitimate tax planning is something legal but the second particular part students the tax evasion this is always an illegal cases i think all of you need not be told what is this tax evasion but any simple example like concealment of some income or bogus claim of deduction of an expenditure which the ssc has not incurred all these are the examples concealment of income bogus claim of the expenditure of bogus claim of the expenditure which has not been incurred at first place so all these examples which is there these examples are for the purpose of the tax planning a uh, sorry tax evasion is tax evasion permissible in the law and the answer is no tax evasion is not permissible in law and accordingly in fact it is illegal and that is one thing which we all are aware so for that we don't require any legislation something which is illegal for that we may not, we have penalty provisions we have prosecution provisions isn't it so those are the provision which was already there the third part students this is a catch part what is that the gar provision the tax avoidance case where the gar provision is applicable so what is this tax avoidance tax avoidance means what minimization of one's tax liability by taking advantage of legally available tax planning opportunities whatever is available you are not doing anything illegal like my example which i gave it to you that you have shifted your asset to that to your 18 year old son from that asset there is an income of rupees 2 and 1/2 lakhs per annum now you tell me one thing is this transaction of yours shifting your asset to your child 18 year old child from which an income is earned of 2 and 1/2 lakhs your child 18 year old child also file his roi showing 2 and 1/2 lakhs of the income in his roi is this an Ill illegal thing an answer is no so this is permissible this is not considered as something which is illegal so tax avoidance may be contrasted with evasion which we have just discussed which entails the reduction so which entails means the tax avoidance sorry the tax evasion entails the reduction of tax liability by using illegal means illegal means so this is primarily how the things are there in this regard now on this point students there is an example of something which has been there tax avoidance black law dictionary the arrangement is entered into solely or primarily for the purpose of obtaining a tax advantage so solely or primarily for the purpose of obtaining tax advantage and does not have any commercial substance 
this is a definition in the black law dictionary students i'll tell you one thing and just pay attention to this part it there is very thin line sometimes it becomes very difficult to distinguish whether it is a case of a tax planning or a tax evasion or, or a tax avoidance very thin line sometimes it's a very thin line distinction that is there in this two cases so therefore how do we sometimes how we can distinguish that whether it is a case of a tax planning or a tax avoidance this is the question that needs to be answered so what should be asked you can also copy down this what should be asked is whether is whether ssc would have undertaken those steps or transaction even if even if there was no tax reduction this is the question students that has to be asked that whether the ssc would have still conducted this particular transaction even though there was no tax benefit which was available if you say the answer to be yes or it can be no so yes he would have taken into account so will this be a tax avoidance then that i would have conducted this transaction irrespective whether i'm getting a tax benefit or not then in that particular case will it be will this transaction or an arrangement or these steps will it be considered to be towards tax avoidance and the answer is no irrespective whether the provision gave me the tax benefit or not i would have continued to carry out these transactions so therefore students this will be this will be what this will be a case of it will be a case of what the no tax avoidance no tax avoidance no tax avoidance and if you say the answer to be no that is to say you would not have conducted this particular transaction if you would not have got the tax benefit if this is what is a positioning then you would have said that it is a tax avoidance it is a tax avoidance means you would have not pursued the transaction if the tax benefit would not have been there then yes that becomes an example of a tax avoidance the classic example that we used to give a year couple of years back because now even the mauritius route is not that favorable but we used to always give this example and in fact in my class also i have detailed out this mauritius route and singapore route i've told you in the class students that what earlier people used to do they used to route the investment in the stock market the indian same public they used to route primarily the investment in the indian stock market via mauritius route why they used to do that what they used to do they used to set up an offshore company in mauritius and the fund used to get transferred to that particular company from which that company used to make the investment where in the indian stock markets that was a very popular way of making the investment the entire idea was that the indian mauritius dtwa the treaty provision provided that what was a provision that if any capital gain occurs to a mauritius resident then the capital gains chargeability will be in the country of resident which is mauritius and not in the country of source which is india and that is the reason why they used to set up a company 
in Mauritius from where these investments were being made. Same was, same was also the case with Singapore. Even from Singapore, the investment used to come in India and they used to take this particular India-Singapore DTAA benefit that whatever the income in the nature of capital gains which would be earned in India by a Singapore resident, that income will be taxed where in Singapore. And accordingly, nobody used to pay any capital gains tax. Or the capital gains tax in the country of resident was very less. So, you tell me, if this provision or the treaty would not have been there, then whether they would have conducted this particular transaction, which is the transaction or which is the steps or which is the arrangement, the transaction or the steps or the arrangement that I am talking about is setting up an offshore company in Mauritius or in Singapore, from where the investment is made in India. This particular transaction was conducted or this step or this arrangement was being made only for the purpose of, only for the purpose of obtaining the tax benefit available through a treaty. And therefore, students, if this would not have been there, then this particular arrangement or the step would not have been made and accordingly, we say that this is a case of a tax avoidance. So, this is where your GAR will come into picture. This is where the GAR will come into picture. Now, students, in the next page, primarily, applicability of GAR. Now, in, the, in between, there are some CBDD circulars also, students, which I have given in for. So, we will look into those very important CBDD circulars because I feel that those circulars would be very important for your MCQ. So, just be very careful on that particular part. So, tax mitigation. Tax mitigation, tax planning involves legal measures with substance to save taxes. So, there is legal measure, but they are specifically provided in the law. Setting up of unit in SEZ to claim exemption under section 10 AA, this is permissible because specifically, now GAR will not be applicable because specifically provided in the law. Tax evasion, we all know these are illegal. So, even GAR provision does not apply over here. Why? Because the existing provision is enough to capture those all illegal activities. So, GAR is not coming over there. Where the GAR comes? Where I have raised the question just above. Whether you would have carried out this transaction or this step or this arrangement or this operation if you would not have got the tax benefit. This is the bottom line. This is the question that has to be asked. If the SSC would have continued to carry the transaction or that step or that arrangement or that operation, even though even though he would not have got the tax benefit, then in that particular case, what we will say that this is not a case of a tax avoidance. So, you will say that every fact, every fact has to be looked upon on case to case basis and on that we have to get this answer of yes or no to finally conclude whether it is a tax avoidance case or not or whether the GAR provision will it be made applicable or not. This has to be targeted for every case, every case and therefore I say the GAR provision students is nothing but a question of law. The GAR provision is nothing but a question, sorry, question of facts. Why a question of facts? Every case has to be analyzed and this question needs to be asked for every facts of each case that would you would have carried out this transaction steps, arrangement, operations, even though you would not have got tax benefit. If you, the, if you say the answer to be yes, then in that particular case, we will say, say what? That the GAR provision will be, GAR provision will be applicable uh, sorry, the GAR provision will not be applicable because the idea was commercial transaction and not 
the tax benefit. Tax benefit was secondary, but primary was the commercial transaction or the commercial substance. So, students here, let us look upon to this one. Now, as I told you students, the act has already various specific provision towards anti-avoidance which I gave you some example of clubbing. Apart from that, what are the various other provision where specifically the act has targeted the attempt made by the SSC to avoid the tax, all these other provisions. I gave you clubbing, transfer pricing. Apart from that, what else that we have? I have given you the entire list. Now students, I will add one more list in this entire discussion so that we, because I feel that Finance Act 2018 has made one very important amendment and that amendment can be there for your examination. What is that amendment? Let us have a look towards that particular part. Students, it is a case of a reverse merger. So, FA, so I will write here specific anti avoidance rule FA 2018. So, what you can do is, is that give a reference. Give a reference here, also refer specific anti avoidance rule introduced by FA 2018. Wherever you are writing, just make a note of it, can be an important one in the examination by FA 18. So students, this is a case of a reverse merger. Now what is this reverse merger? Before that, I can give you a background. Students, we all know that dividend distribution tax is charged under section 1150. That dividend is always subject to the accumulated profit of the company. Subject to what? The accumulated profit of the company. So, that dividend is always subject to the accumulated profit of the company. So, if supposingly the amount of distribution is say 10 lakhs, whereas your accumulated profit is only rupees 7 lakhs, then what would be the amount of dividend? The amount of dividend would be rupees 7 lakhs because the distribution that you have made has to be made subject to, subject to what? The accumulated profits. And only that much of the portion is referred as a dividend and only on that 1150 will be made applicable. So, students in this context, let us have a look. So, here is a case of a company. Let me give you this particular category. See, there is a company, company A and company B. Now, company A has got a profit of say rupees 1 crore. Now, at the same time here, the company who has got a profit of 1 crore, now they want to distribute the dividend but they do know if they will distribute from this profit dividend, then there will be a dividend distribution tax, is not it? So, what they do is this that there is another company which is more like what? Is a say a loss making company and maybe with a very few shareholders, with few shareholders, a private company whatever it be. So, here there is a loss of say maybe 20 lakhs. Now, generally we all know that the merger that we see is from the loss to the profit making company. That is a general trend. But here there can be a situation where there is a reverse merger that may take place and company A 
this is known as reverse merger. Reverse merger. What do you mean by reverse merger? Where a loss, oh sorry, where a profit making company merges with a loss making company. Fine students. Now, after that, so merges with a loss making company. So, after merger, here now company B will have a profit of 80 lakhs and then thereafter dividend is distributed. From then thereafter, the dividend is distributed. Dividend is distributed. So, in this case, the question to be asked is herein is about DDT under section 1150. Will it be applicable? This is the question to be asked. So, technically speaking, students, the profit which is available now with company B is rupees 80 lakhs. Company B, the profit which is available is rupees 80 lakhs. This particular profit that is available with company B, 80 lakhs. This particular profit is nothing but a profit which it has accrued on account of amalgamation. That is not on account of its normal operation of business. So, this profit would be referred as what? As a capital reserve because company B got this profit on account of amalgamation and not on account of any normal course of business. And therefore, this 80 lakhs will be considered as, as what? As a capital reserve. Now students, whether a capital reserve can it be considered as a part of your accumulated profit? We will say generally, definitely the answer to be no. And from capital reserve, if it is not a part of your if it is not a part of your accumulated profit, then if the capital reserve is what is distributed amongst the shareholder, therefore, whether the DDT under 1150, will that be charged? Again, the answer is no. What is the reason? Reason is that this does not form part of the accumulated profit. So, we will say the answer to be no, since, since what? Herein. Profit arising on amalgamation, profit arising on amalgamation shall not be considered as an accumulated profit but is in the nature of capital reserve, but it is in the nature of capital reserve. Fine students, and this is where the loophole existed in the existing law. People in order to avoid, avoid what? DDT they were doing reverse merger. In order to avoid DDT, they were doing reverse merger. Now, you tell me, if the tax benefit was not available, what is the tax benefit in this case, in this example? The tax benefit is that there is a saving of DDT. So, you tell me, if this tax benefit would not have been made available, then whether company A would have merged into company B? whether company A, which is a profit making company, whether it would have been ready to lose its existence and would have been merged to company B and the answer is no. So, the very reason of this merger was to obtain the tax benefit and as I told you, this could have been covered in the general anti-avoidance rule, but what the government did, 
they have created a specific law to target all these sort of situation. So, they have created a specific law to target all these sort of situation and hence the specific what is there, the SAR provision which is there, which is the amendment, please write the amendment which is there in this context. Explanation 2A is inserted in section 2 clause 22 to widen the scope to widen the scope of the accumulated profits and to negate the proposition in the case study above. Negate means to take out the proposition arising in the case study above. So, what is that? In the case of an amalgamated company, comma, amalgamated company, the accumulated profits whether the accumulated profit whether capitalized or not shall be increased now this is the point this is where the amendment comes shall be increased shall be increased by the accumulated profits of shall be increased by the accumulated profit accumulated profits whether capitalized or not, whether capitalized or not, of the amalgamating company of the amalgamating company on the date of amalgamation. on the date of amalgamation. So, students, this is where the amendment lies. On the date of amalgamation. So, this is a specific anti avoidance rule. So, now you tell me, after this amendment, what would be the accumulated profit of company B? which is the amalgamated company, after this amendment what would be the accumulated profit of company B would be 80 lakhs. So, if this is the accumulated profit then on that 80 lakhs which is distributed by the amalgamating company primarily will uh, sorry by the amalgamated company to its shareholder whether the amalgamated company which is company B will it be charged to DDT and the answer is yes. So, this is one thing which you should be very careful about it. So, this is also a specific anti avoidance rule which is there in this particular law which I have just now have explained to all of you. Fine students. Now, come back to this particular proposition. Here in students, 
the question why is this sar i'm giving you as a reference here there is a cbd circular on this particular part can the gar provision be applicable if already there is a specific provision in respect of the same can the gar provision can be can it be made applicable if there is already a specific provision in respect of the same so students one thumb rule is this that and we all know that look the gar provision which is there this particular provision which we all do this is a general provision and then there is a specific provision and whenever there is a conflict between a general and specific then we all know that the specific provision will prevail over the general provision this is what we all know and even cbdt has admitted cbdt has admitted that if there is already a specific anti avoidance rule to target that particular case for that the general anti avoidance rule will not be made applicable like the transfer pricing cases if there is a transaction between an a for a particular transfer price which is leading to the erosion of the tax base in india which is leading to the erosion of the tax base in india then in that particular case will you apply will you apply the general anti avoidance rule and the answer is no we always apply the transfer pricing provision which is a specific provision and it is what it is sufficient enough to handle those particular anti avoidance those particular avoidance made by the ssc that is sufficient enough so therefore if or for a particular situation there exist already a specific anti avoidance rule then for those particular cases we will not apply the general anti avoidance rule we will not apply what the general anti avoidance rule did you all got this one students so in this regard will the gar be invoked if sar applies then the general answer is no but in this context be careful cbdt has not ruled out the applicability of gar provision even though there is a application of sar provision cbdt has not ruled out those cases i'll give an example to highlight that special case where both gar as well as sar can coexist i will give you the example of that special case where both the gar provision and the sar provision can coexist students you may be aware of section 94b thin capitalization isn't it so thin capitalization we have seen and in the thin capitalization chapter we have seen that if the indian a has taken a loan from its foreign a okay and even though there can be a case of an arms length price they may be paying an interest to its foreign a the indian a who has taken the loan they may be paying the interest to the foreign a at a rate of interest which is at arms length still 94b says that only up to 30% of ebitda only up to 30% of ebitda is the maximum amount of the deduction of interest so whatever the amount of interest that you have paid that amount of interest would be would be what would be compared with 30% of ebitda would be compared with 30% of ebitda isn't it so it implies that so for example here in my ebitda is say 100 crore 30% is say 30 crore interest which i have paid is say 45 crores so what i'll say 15 crore under section 94b disallowed 
16, 15 crores under section 94B is disallowed, which means that I am allowing 30 crores, which means that I am allowing 25, 30 crores. Out of 45, I am allowing 30 crores. My question to all of you is this, can even this 30 crores can be disallowed? Can even this 30 crores could it be disallowed? Then as far as 94B is concerned, no. 94B says that look, we 30, what we disallowed is in excess of 30 percent of EBITDA. What we disallow is in excess of 30 percent of EBITDA. This is what we are disallowing. So up to 30 percent of EBITDA, that is allowed. And accordingly, this is where the GAR will come into picture. The GAR will ask this question of this loan transaction. Did you took the loan from your A? What was the very purpose of taking the loan? All these questions would be asked. And they would have gone to finally conclude that this loan transaction is a sin if they the the entire investigation finally concludes that this loan transaction between the AEs was essentially to avoid the tax in India, then in that case the GAR provision can be applied to even disallow, disallow what? The 30 crores of the interest expenditure. So this is where even students the GAR provision will come into play. So please take a note of this particular point which is there but before that let us read it out what the CBDT has to say. So CBDT has stated that it is internationally accepted that specific anti-avoidance provision may not address all situation of abuse and there is a need for general anti-abuse provision in the domestic legislation. The provision and GAR and SAR can coexist and are applicable as may be necessary. It is not that in all the cases as may be necessary in the facts and circumstances of the case. So, if it was not required, if SAR is the SAR provision which is there, if those are comprehensive enough to address the anti-avoidance aspect of the law, then yes, we will only go by the SAR provision. But if we find that still there is some room of maneuvering on the part of the SSC who can still take some sort of an advantage, then in those cases can GAR provision can come into picture? And the answer is yes. The example which I have just now shared with all of you highlights that particular point. So students, you can just try to take a note of this one. And right here, whether GAR and SAR could coexist. Write the answer. If the SAR provision is comprehensive enough to target by the way, I should tell to all of you, it is applicable for both old and new, this GAR provision. So it is not that it is only for the new course, it is applicable for both old and new course. So if the SAR provision is comprehensive enough to target the avoidance of tax. sought by the SSC, through an arrangement transactions etc., then GAR provision 
shall not be invoked. However, consider the following case. The case of 94B students, just take a note of it. Section 94B provides that notwithstanding anything contained in the act interest paid to an a and exceeding thirty percent of EBITDA will be disallowed, will be disallowed under specified circumstances. Will section 94B override GAR or will it be other way? or both provision will continue to apply. Okay. So, this sort of question students you will be targeted. These are all conceptual questions. And be very careful about this. Even those students who are appearing for their elective, be careful on these kind of a conceptual questions that would be posed on the GAR provisions. Our level is a bit on a higher side for the only reason that the examination pattern is also on the higher side. And we have seen what kind of questions the ICI is capable for both old and new course in the direct tax CA final. So let us not take any chance. Conceptually, you should be very thorough. And that is the very idea that you should know everything with the MCQ also kind of a pattern. You just can't read it only the provision without having the ability to apply the provision in a particular given situation. So you will write here prima facie. There will be a disallowance of interest under Section 94B to the extent. specified in the provision the application 
of section 94 B is mandatory being a specific provision being a specific provision intention of tax avoidance need not be established in order to apply SAR. So this is very important, isn't it, Swiss? That whether I should be establishing that the SSC had intent like in transfer pricing provision, do I need to establish that the SSC had the intention to avoid the tax liability in India? And the answer is no. Even the genuine cases where the two A's would have undertaken a transaction and where that pricing would have been kept deliberately low or less, not deliberately, you can say uh, maybe because of say circumstances may be such that the pricing is kept a bit low and that circumstances could have happened with any other person, but they have kept the answer very, uh, the, the pricing a bit low. That has resulted into the avoidance of the tax liability in India. So, although it would have resulted into the avoidance of the tax liability in India, still in this case, the transfer pricing provision would be applicable because there we only compare ALP and the transfer pricing provision, ALP and the transfer price. That is the only two aspects that we are comparing in the transfer pricing law. Yes, if you remember students, before we introduce the chapter of transfer pricing, I told you what was the intention of the lawmaker to introduce this specific provision. Intention of the lawmaker to introduce this specific provision. But once this specific provision now is in place, once this specific provision is now in place, now at this point of time, are we supposed to see whether there is an intention on the part of the SSC to avoid the taxes, whether these intentions has to be looked upon and the answer is no. What is that you will now go with? You will now go with that there is a transfer price. You will have to determine the ALP and where the difference results into the tax avoidance case. Then yes, you will apply the transfer pricing provision. Now, whether there was an intention on the part of the SSC to avoid the tax or not has got no relevance. This we do in the this, this, this R provision. The intention is not to be established. Why I am focusing here this point more? Because in the GAR provision, this intention has to be established. That question which I ask to all of you, that if the tax benefit would not have been there, then whether you would have done this. If the tax benefit would not have been there, then whether you would have done this. So, what is that we are getting into it? We are getting into it the on the intention part, on the intention part, isn't it? And that is what will have to be established in GAR. So, continue further students, herein. So, need not be established. However, if it is determine determine that the arrangement results into an impermissible
impermissible avoidance. Impermissible avoidance element. You will say, what is this very high five word? This has to be remembered. You will come to know now in the GAR, they have used the word that this, it means that this results into tax benefit, meaning the SSC intention was to obtain the tax benefit. So, such situation when your intention was to obtain the tax benefit, such arrangement is known as impermissible avoidance arrangement for which chapter? The GAR chapter. So, however, if it is determined that the arrangement results into an impermissible avoidance arrangement, then GAR can be invoked. If GAR is invoked, then the extent to which the interest is not disallowed in the bracket that is up to 30 percent of EBITDA shall also attract disallowance shall also attract disallowance. So, even that much of the portion of interest which is otherwise not disallowed in in the GAR provision, so the so in the SAR provision of 94 B that is up to 30 percent of EBITDA, even that much of the amount will get disallowed. Students, this is what it is in respect of this particular part, if you have copied, now let us come back to our discussion. Through with this, fine, let us look upon to this now. This is a treaty part shouldn't the next particular part, again it is covered by the CBDT, the, this point that you are this referring, will GAR be applied? to deny treaty eligibility in a case where there is no compliance with LOB test of the treaty. Treaty students has now got specifically the Mauritius and the Singapore treaty. These two treaty has now got the LOB clause introduced in their treaty between India. This treaty primarily is, this LOB is what simple put, they will give you a threshold that this resident of Singapore or resident of Mauritius will be in a position to invoke Singapore India or Mauritius India DTAA only if there, ha there is some commercial substance in those companies which are based in Mauritius and Singapore. Now, that commercial substance of that company, they will have their own threshold like what would be the expenditure, they have got their own threshold. I will not give much of details because for old course students this kind of knowledge is not necessary, but since it is there in the CBD circular, you should know. So, students herein, they actually otherwise what happens? I will Im incorporate a dummy company in Singapore or a dummy company in Mauritius. Now, that company does not have any commercial substance, it is only a paper company. So, merely I have incorporated the company in Mauritius and Singapore and I got the residential status of Singapore and Mauritius for that company, does it will be sufficient enough for those company to invoke Singapore India or Mauritius India DTAA and the answer is no. Therefore, this treaty provides that look you need to also be having commercial substance 
in those particular company or institution which is going to invoke the treaty with India. So, they actually give the threshold of their commercial transactions. So, that threshold if met only then we will consider that you are not a paper company in Mauritius and Singapore. You are not a paper company. Paper company means a company which is merely a letterbox company does not have any commercial transaction with it. It is only meant for the purpose of taking the treaty benefits. So, there are some specific provisions which are introduced in the treaty itself to target these kind of situations. So, in those cases students, will GAR be applied to deny treaty eligibility in a case where there is a compliance with LOB test of the treaty means if that company has satisfied the commercial substance test which is nothing but the LOB test will still the GAR be applicable? We will say the answer is no. Why? Because those company of Singapore and Mauritius now could be considered to be a genuine company based in Mauritius and Singapore which are also taking lot of commercial transactions and they are not merely floated in those two countries for the purpose of for the purpose of taking the treaty benefits. So, what the CBD has to say? CBD has clarified that adoption of anti-abusive rules in tax treaty may not be sufficient. Again, the same thing that they initially start that look, it may not be if the the anti avoidance rule may not be fully covering each and every aspect, each and every aspect. So, if it is not covering, if the treaty is not covering each and every aspect of the anti avoidance rule, then in all those cases the GAR will be applicable. But where the treaty already has a specific coverage on a particular matter in respect of anti avoidance rule, then, then in that case the GAR will not apply. But as I told you, the treaty may not address all the cases of anti avoidance rule. Whether then in those cases GAR can be made applicable and the answer is yes. So, students here, CBD has clarified that adoption of anti abuse rules in tax treaty may not be sufficient to address all the tax avoidance strategies. So, it may not be sufficient, but if it is sufficient to a particular case, then the treaty itself will prevail because it is specific in nature and the same are required to be tackled through the domestic anti avoidance rule. But if, if a case of avoidance is sufficiently addressed by LOB in the treaty, there shall not be an occasion to invoke GAR. Okay, so, they are clearing that point. If there is a case which is already addressed specifically in the treaty, then there is no need to now invoke the GAR. So, this is some important CBD circular students which we have introduced here. Introduction of the GAR, this particular part is fine. Initial reference are all good. Primary, the real situation starts with this particular aspect. Now, this is an important one. Whether the GAR overrides the treaty, notwithstanding, see herein why the GAR will override the treaty. Now, earlier we used to always take a blanket shelter of treaty that look, there is a treaty already in place and because there is a treaty already in place, treaty provision will prevail over, over the income tax law. Yes, it will prevail over the income tax law subject to the GAR provision, meaning if the benefit which is sought to be taken from the treaty is essentially, essentially a tax benefit which is, which is referred as an impermissible avoidance arrangement as per GAR, then, then what? Then in that case, the GAR provision will override the treaty provision. In a simple words, in this case where you are trying to trying to apply the treaty only for the purpose of getting a tax benefit, having lack of commercial substance, then in that case the GAR provisions can be invoked. So, herein notwithstanding anything contained in section 92 subsection 2, the provision of chapter 10a of the act shall apply to the SSC even if such provisions are not beneficial to him. Provided 
the condition of this chapter is satisfied obviously the gar condition has to be satisfied only then that kind of transaction can be considered as as an impermissible avoidance arrangement this is much an important phrase impermissible avoidance arrangement the arrangement which is essentially made with an objective objective of what to get a tax benefit if this is what was the nature of your arrangement to obtain the tax benefit and there is something more which we are going to discuss now then such arrangement will be considered as an impermissible avoidance arrangement and if that is what it is then whether the gar provision will it be applicable and the answer is yes so this is how it has to be considered now with this one students we in get into the core aspect of the general anti avoidance rule now students i will be discussing this thing one by one each and every aspect of this part which has been there students i want all of you just to come to the cbd circular which you can find it towards the end clarification of cbd on gar i think if somebody is referring the capsule book then it is 894 those who are referring capsule Eight ninety four. clarification of cbd on gar so on this particular part students here in threshold of 3 crores in respect of tax benefit in a relevant assessment year arising in aggregate to all the parties to the arrangement 3 crores threshold meaning thereby the tax benefit not the tax amount the tax benefit should be minimum 3 crores so this is primarily one of the very important aspect that they have given the threshold of the applicability of such a massive provision then the threshold award is 3 crores second is the gar not to apply to foreign institutional investor to the fis again it is not applicable in this regard but for this for which this condition would be required to be satisfied so this is one of the part which i want you to always keep in mind before we start reading this particular main condition the threshold limit is one now apart from this what else that we do have in this regard students if you see the first one can gar lead to assessment of notional income or disallowance of real expenditure will gar provision expand the scope of charging provision or the scope of taxable base that is a point which has been mentioned over here so notional income so cbd has clarified that the arrangement covered here in 
is what is an impermissible avoidance arrangement then the arrangement will be disregarded by application of gar and necessary consequence will follow so what exactly it is primarily this part and all the other particular aspect of the gar students we will look into in the part b of our lecture the part b we will now start primarily after there is some sort of i think the technical team has just given me a hint that there is some lip sync which is to be sorted out so i think we will introduce the part b after this wherein i'll start with the substantive provision okay see you then in the part b